On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Black Hats get a visit from the man from Juniper. Comcast and Netflix are pushing back against net neutrality, and we've got a Wi Fi panel like no other. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 198, recorded July 15th, 2016. Wi Fi Jamboree. Welcome to Twyatt. This week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I can't guide you by myself. For that, I'm going to need a little help from my friends, especially Mr. Curtis Franklin. He is from Information Week Radio. Curtis, it's a little stormy over on the right coast. Are, are you going to be okay for the show? I hope so. We've got, uh, as you say, thunder and lightning happening outside the uh, window here. But hey, it's summertime. I'm in Florida, so nothing unusual there. Uh, and surely not even the cloud and the sky would interfere with something as important as Twyatt. Fantastic. And uh, speaking of thunder and lightning, we've got quite an episode for you this week. We're bringing in not one, not two, but three guests from Ruckus from Pony Express and from NetScout, who are going to be talking about the trials and the tribulations of Wi-Fi in large venues. So if you are an engineer, an IT folk who needs to deal with Wi-Fi, you're going to want to stay tabbed. But first, let's go ahead and jump into the blips. Well, it's been a bad, 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 bad year for Juniper Networks, and it's just getting worse. Last December, Juniper acknowledged that their firewalls included unauthorized code disguised as debugging code that played man in the middle to VPN traffic, sur surreptitiously decrypting traffic before passing it through. This past Wednesday, Juniper announced that they had fixed a bug in their Junos operating system that skipped peer certificate validation as long as the issuer name had matched one of the certificate authorities enrolled in Junos. In other words, if an attacker had a list of valid CAs, a trivial task, they could submit a self-signed cryptographical certificate with an issuer name that matches one of the companies on that list, completely bypassing CA vetting. With those valid invalid certificates, an attacker could establish a VPN tunnel that would give them access to the network. A fix has already been issued, so if you have a Juniper product, it's time to get patching. AWS is getting even bigger. Amazon in unveiled expanded database migration and replication services at the Amazon Summit 2016 in Santa Clara this week. SAP Adaptive Server Enterprise, formerly known as Sybase, joins Oracle and SQL Server on the list of on-premise systems that customers may integrate into or away from the cloud. In addition, migrations from Oracle data, data warehouses and Teradata warehouses into Amazon Redshift are now supported by AWS Database Migration Service. The company also announced that one-click data replication will be added as a standalone service that can continue replicating data to a target system as part of a company's data durability and data recovery plans. As two of the last truly independent UC vendors in the market, Polycom and Mitel were hoping that a $1.96 billion acquisition of the former by the letter would let them compete on equal footing with the big boys. However, it seems that it's not to be. Polycom pulled out of a year-long acquisition talk after receiving and accepting a $2 billion bid from New York-based private equity firm Cirrus Capital Group. The deal amounts to $1,250 each for all of Polycom's outstanding common stock. Polycom did offer Canada-based Mitel a chance to top the offer, and after negotiations fell through, paid its former suitor a $60 million termination fee. With the Polycom board of directors agreeing to the new deal, with which the termination penalty is worth less than the Mitel offer in under 24 hours. There is now speculation that Polycom wasn't okay with losing its name, being absorbed into Mitel, and the ensuing workforce uncertainty that the merger would entail. For its part, Mitel must now scramble to find the enterprise advantage that it was hoping to get with Polycom. 
Microsoft launches an online data science degree program. Microsoft is launching a new professional degree designed to provide what it says is university caliber curriculum for technology pros. The initial curriculum will focus on a data science degree program. The program is built on a new Microsoft Azure hosted Open edX, an online learning platform that enables any of its partners to design and deliver their own learning curriculum to customers and students. Microsoft will use its open learning platform to offer its professional degree program, starting with a degree in data science. The company said, quote, a significant skill gap exists in the data science field, end quote, and this new degree program will help address that gap. Microsoft said it consulted data scientists and the companies that employ them to identify the requisite core skills. Then, the company developed a curriculum to teach functional and technical skills, combining online courses with hands-on labs, concluding in a final capstone project. The courses can be audited for free, but to receive credit toward the professional degree, students need to buy a verified certificate for each of the 10 courses. During the pilot phase, the certificate for the orientation course is $25, the certificate for the statistical thinking course is $99, and all other course certificates are $49 each. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit reversed, vacated, and remanded a lower court decision that would have forced Microsoft to give the United States Department of Justice emails on a server in Ireland. Ju Judge Susan Carney wrote the decision for the court, stating that the Stored Communications Act does not, in fact, authorize U.S. courts to issue and enforce judgments for the seizure of customer content that is stored exclusively on servers in a foreign country, even if the owner of those servers is a U.S.-based company. She goes on to explain that the United States warrants have always carried territorial limitations, specifically within the U.S. and U.S.-controlled lands, and that the warrant authority cannot exceed those limitations even for digital content. The United States Department of Justice has sued Microsoft for civil contempt of court for noncompliance with the warrant, but now its lawyers are forced to look at its legal options for continuing the case. Microsoft rolls out Skype Alpha on Linux and Chrome. This week, Microsoft released the alpha version of its Skype app for Linux client. This is a brand new WebRTC version of the Skype for Linux app. Now, while it's not yet a fully functioning Skype client, there are several differences between the new Skype for Linux alpha and the previous edition of Skype for Linux uses. The Skype for Linux alpha can place calls to people who are using the latest versions of Skype on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. However, it cannot be used to make or receive calls to or from people with the previous version of Skype for Linux. The Skype team has also released an alpha version of Skype based on WebRTC for Chromebook and Chrome. Users can now access web.skype.com to make one-on-one -on -one and group call voice calls in addition to using current messaging features. Microsoft's launch of Skype on Linux is a sign it is acknowledging the success of its open approach to putting its software on alternate platforms. The company notes, this launch is a sign it will continue to support Linux users in the years to come. Hey, Twight Riot, do you have cloud skills? Do you know the ins and outs of premise colo and hybrid development? Do, you, do they call you when DevOps is stuck on a problem? Well, if so, the enterprise is definitely hiring. A recent study of 500 business managers and IT execs found the quote-unquote lack of qualified cloud-savvy candidates as one of the major issues in infrastructure hiring. The soft choice study found that more and more enterprises are convinced of the financial and DevOps benefits of a cloud strategy, and yet the real experience to plan and implement those strategies is sorely lacking. The shortage is so acute that 25% of managers admitted that they don't involve their in-house IT for application and service planning or purchase. 49% of respondents reported that they could finish cloud projects faster without involving IT in-house IT, while a full half of them admitted to canceling initiatives because of the deployment time, budget restrictions, and a simple lack of the right people. Furthermore, while 67% of the respondents reported that they've recently hired staff whose primary job is to implement a cloud initiative, more than half of those hires have gone horribly wrong because of the huge disconnect between cloud training and real-world cloud experience. So, if the cloud holds no mystery for you, it's time to upgrade your career. Well, that does it for the blips. Let's go ahead and jump into the bites. This first one is, well, it's a story that we tend to revisit quite a bit. It's net neutrality. It's no longer a bright line definition anymore. It's getting fuzzier and fuzzier as more companies roll out services that seem to buck 
against the rules of net neutrality. Now, the longtime rivals of conflicts, Com Comcast and Netflix conflicts, recently confirmed that Comcast's X1 interactive television box will offer Netflix obviating the need for a smart TV or a third-party device like a Roku or a Chromecast. The two companies said little more than the combination arrives later this year, and it remains to be seen whether you'll pay a separate fee to use Netflix. The most, uh, the answer most certainly is yes, if Comcast's previous price structure is anything to judge by. The bigger question is whether that will all will also need Comcast internet service to watch Netflix over X1, or if it's automatically included, and and if so, will watching Netflix eat into the internet data plan. Now, Comcast did not respond to requests for comment, but content viewed via X1 doesn't typically count as data because it's considered television. Making Netflix part of the television service would be great for customers who use Comcast's television service and worry about exceeding the one terabyte threshold that the company is testing in place. But then again, such an arrangement would raise net neutrality questions since it could put Comcast in the position of choosing sides in the streaming video market. Curtis... This is the sort of the blurring of the lines that we we wondered about. Uh, as companies start to deal more and more with the net neutrality regulations, which are now well entrenched, they're established, they're not going anywhere, they're going to start testing the limits of what they can and cannot do. For example, T-Mobile, with their binge on service, really pushed the boundaries. They, they offered zero sum for services that brought their equipment within the T-Mobile network. It looks like Comcast is willing to do the same, but there are those who are saying that this this is different because Comcast is already a television provider. And because they now can say you need to subscribe to our tel television service, otherwise you'll hit the cap. There, there are those who are saying this is a soft break in net neutrality. What's, what's your take? Well, I think this is one of those cases where the, the ability of the, the companies to do things is racing way ahead of the regulator's imagination. Because I, I think this is going to come down to a couple of points. One is, oddly enough, how it's built. If Netflix is billed as part of the television, the cable television billing, then I think it's they will make the argument that it's entirely outside of any sort of net neutrality rules because it is a television service just like HBO or Showtime or the Weather Channel. But what we're seeing here as well is then whether you could, could have Netflix in two ways. And is Netflix that you subscribe to over the Comcast internet service different in some material way from the, from the Netflix you get if you have it on your bill? And again, the, the instigating piece of this is the fact that they're bundling onto the services of their set-top box. Um, you know, we all know that there is a level at which all of it is data, just like when we talk on our telephones or our cell phones, it's all data at, at one level. Um, it, it's going to come down to how it's billed, and I'm not sure how the FCC is planning to fight that battle. Uh, they could fight it very aggressively, um, and if they do that, they could end up with all kinds of interesting ramifications for how things are billed on your, your cable bill, then again, they could decide to just throw up their hands and decide that, uh, you know, this is the way things are going to be. So we haven't heard anywhere nearly the end of this. Um, the, the good folks out in the cable providers are going to muddy the waters as rapidly and completely as they can. You know, we've got people in the chat room who are having a really good discussion about how we've seen this before. We saw this when the cell phone vendors, when the ISPs, wanted to charge differently for bits that were text messages versus bits that were voice. Uh, go back even before that, when we were switching over the telecom system in, in this country from circuit switch to packet switch, there was that 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 pause, that, that year where they weren't really sure how to charge it. Now people are looking at something like this and they're saying, look, these artificial distinctions are just, they're, they're, they're muddying the waters unnecessarily. Bits are bits. If you're delivering over IP video content, how is that different from delivering web data, uh, from delivering pictures, and from delivering Netflix and Hulu, et cetera, et cetera? Is the only reason why we're having this problem because Comcast is such a large 
vertical integrated market because it is a delivery system and because it is a network and because it is now a content producer that's what's drawing down extra scrutiny i think it's drawing down ex extra scrutiny and i think it also gives them the opportunity to blur these lines more than a lot of other companies can um and and that's really what they're trying to do comcast is big enough that they want to blur the lines they want to push these test cases for, for two reasons. One, they hope certainly that the decision will be made in their favor. But whether they're made in their favor or not, at least they will get decisions. And as we've spoken about in the past here on Twyatt, the thing that business hates more than anything else is uncertainty. They can deal with adverse conditions reasonably well, but not knowing what the conditions are going to be drives them absolutely crazy. Comcast is doing everything they can to eliminate the uncertainty as quickly as they can. We've got Emily the Strange in the chat room saying that uh, she's worried that if the FCC gets too aggressive, it will set precedent and then it will tie the hands of later data usage companies who, who have to come under the net neutrality regulations. But what's, what's interesting for me is that from the very beginning, when the FCC laid down the net neutrality regulations, they, they said, look, we want to be very soft-handed here. We only want to intervene when there is an obvious case of breaking net neutrality. So in that sense, they don't set a precedent. They, they only act when it has become so egregious that they need to come in and make an adjustment. Do you think if, com, if the FCC were to step in and say, no, you can't do this, you can't do this kind of bundling, or if you're going to do this kind of bundling, you have to go the extra step and say, well, we're going to remove caps. If they did that, would it set a dangerous precedent for any ISP looking to deliver content in the future? I don't think so. I think it would set a precedent for how these companies can deliver content. And, and that's the thing. You know, every time the FCC talks about any sort of regulation, we get the um, chorus of the sky is falling. If they do this, then no company will ever invest in infrastructure or, um, or content in the U.S. again. Regulations are promulgated, and strangely enough, we continue to get people wanting to be ISPs and content providers. Why? Because they have to make their shareholders happy, and to do that, they have to continue to push the boundaries and deliver new services and products. So we'll continue to get that. The question is exactly how are they going to, to play it? And um, this is one where... There is a big piece of me that thinks that there are values in keeping the functions separate and keeping things stratified a bit. But um, the development in set-top boxes and the knowledge that everything is truly a data stream and it's all about how you're billing it is going to keep these companies pushing boundaries in different directions just as frequently as they can. Right, right. Okay, one last question before we move on to, to the next bite, and that is... There will be those who say, this is unnecessary. Let the market handle this. Let the market set the rate. If Comcast offers a service that people want, fantastic. They can pay for the service. And if they don't want it, well, then they can go elsewhere. What's, what's wrong with just saying, well, the market will handle? Well, I think the big thing that's wrong with that is that for a huge number of people, I don't know that it's statistically a majority or not, but for a huge number of people, the go elsewhere just is not an option uh, in many, many places around the country, either because of legal monopolies or because just the economics of the size of their city, there is only one option. And for a lot of those people, the one option is Comcast. So if they do, if Comcast does something they don't like, it's not that they have the option to go elsewhere. They just have to either suck it up and pay what Comcast wants and agree to their rules or go back to uh, kite string and oatmeal boxes for their communications. And for lots of people in the, the Internet age, um, that's not really a good option. I think that's going to be the end of that by net neutrality. Suck it up. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. This, this one is a little bit of a turn from what we're used to seeing. We, we, we hear a lot about how U.S. companies are trying to sue, take Chinese companies to task to court, in order to fix some sort of infringement or intellectual theft. Well, not in this case. In this case, we've got the tables turned because Huawei is suing T-Mobile. Now, in a case of 
dang, China is using U.S. patent law against a U.S. company in uh, a case of, of, well, going after T-Mobile. Shenzhen-based Huawei sued T-Mobile last week, asking for a judicial ruling that it's following the right rules for using, quote, standard essential, unquote, patents, which require patents to be licensed on a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory, you may have heard this from Twill, if you watch that on the Twit network, FRAND basis. The new lawsuit is a follow-on lawsuit for four patent infringement lawsuits that Huawei, Huawei filed against T-Mobile in January, all based, again, in the Eastern District of Texas, which, as we know, is where non-practicing entities and lawsuit trolls live. Now, we're now we're, while we're not wild about Huawei's alleged tendency to borrow technology, this is clearly a case of Huawei learning to use U.S. aggressive tactics to take advantage of East Texas. So, Curtis, uh, you you I, you did write a story about this, right? Uh, I haven't written a story about Huawei yet, but but I'm familiar with what's going on, and and very familiar with um, East Texas judicial cases. Right, and we've we've heard the Frand argument before, most notably when we had Samsung versus Apple, Samsung versus everyone, Apple versus everyone, and the whole idea is. If you own intellectual property, you must be reasonable about licensing it to another party. So if, if you have some sort of technology that you've created and it becomes central to, say, the cell phone market, you can't just say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll license, to, license it to you for $2 billion. There has to be some sort of uh, rationale for the cost that you are demanding of, of those companies that want to license it. In this particular case, does does this seem to hold water? Looking at the facts of the case, can Huawei rightfully say T-Mobile is being predatory and unfair in not licensing their technology for a lower price? Well, I think I think it's going to really come down to to a couple of a couple of points. One is, are these standard essential patents? In other words, is this a patent for something like you know using a wire as an antenna or uh, is it something that is much more subtle than that and gives them a, a distinct advantage? The second thing is what's reasonable. Uh, is you know a penny a unit reasonable, uh, or does it need to be an eighth of a cent per unit, or a sixteenth of a cent per unit, or a dollar a unit? Uh, and between those two issues, that's that's where the lawyers are going to be earning lots of money there in East Texas, and. Um, Interestingly enough, East Texas has shown that it's the kind of place that is very willing to allow the patent holder to exert lots of control over their patents. So um, this should be interesting to watch. Yeah, indeed. In fact, there there is something here that it just it just feels weird because these are the tactics that U.S. companies have used against Chinese companies for the better part of a decade. To see it coming back, it, it brings up a couple of questions. First. Interesting. Secondly, does this signal that maybe Asian companies, Chinese companies, are ready to start playing by the rules that, that U.S. companies have to have to work with? Or do you see this just as some smart legal team over at Huawei said, hey, this is going to be a delaying tactic. This will stretch this out over years and years, and by then we'll have moved on. I think that uh, there's a little bit of both because I do think that what we're seeing is international companies deciding that they can have figured out how the U.S. legal system works and that if the U.S. companies can take advantage of our legal system uh, for intellectual property cases, they can too. Um, and, and so I think we'll see a lot more of this, not only from companies based in Asia, but from uh, all kinds of international companies. Uh, and so I think you're going to see lots and lots of uh, international uh, travelers heading for East Texas uh, dressed in very natty suits so that they can make their claims in the, that uh, court. Indeed. Well, that does it for the bites. We're going to move on to my favorite part of the show. This is when we bring some outside experts on to This Week in Enterprise Tech to have them dump their knowledge upon the Twite Riot. And again, we don't have one, not two, but three Wi-Fi experts. Let's start with Heather Williams, of ruckus that's right she is the queen of wi-fi now she's not representing what ruckus she is representing herself but heather could you please say a few things about what it is that you do at ruckus um in general i just make things up as i go along but um 
Uh, I've had, I'm a, uh, a channel systems engineer and I have responsibility for the, uh, anybody who has a North America footprint. So the distributors and anybody that's a national account. And under that heading, it seems to be that uh, I got uh, tagged with the, um, the conference Wi-Fi's. Right. And of course, that's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about high density, very dynamic Wi-Fi deployments. And you deal a lot with that because that's that's one of the things that Ruckus specializes in. Joining you from Pony Express is Mr. Rick Farina. He is the director of R&D. And he's coming to us from what looks like um, a storage closet. Yeah, this is the R&D closet. Uh, that's what all the that's what all my coworkers call it. <laughs> okay. And of course, we had Pony Express on just, just a few episodes ago. Uh, they were showing us a fantastic appliance that allowed you to really sort of reach into branches and remote offices and find out what was happening on the network. Uh, what, what is your experience with Wi-Fi? Uh, my experience with Wi-Fi is I've been doing Wi-Fi security uh, mostly on the semi-darker side. Uh, if you've ever used a tool to crack Wi-Fi, odds are I had a hand in it. Uh, without those kinds of tools, we're unable to determine what's actually broken versus what isn't broken. And that's that's what we use to to actually make sure things get fixed. So that's that's mostly what I do is I develop the evil to find the good. You know, Rick, I believe when you said dark side, there were ears all over the Twilight Ride that just kind of perked up. So I, I think you're going to fit in quite well with our audience. And, and last but not least is Mr. Christopher Hins from NetScout. I wanted to say Heinz, but no, I've been told it's Hins. He is the product manager at NetScout. Uh, Christopher, uh, what has been your work with Wi-Fi? Well, here at NetScout, I've been managing some of our products that come from our Air Magnet product line that are primarily Wi-Fi focused. Uh, myself, I've been in the Wi-Fi industry now for a little over 16 years. Uh, gosh, I, I've gone to IEEE doing stuff as well as been with the Wi-Fi Alliance, including spent some time uh, on the board of directors for one of my previous companies. Well, the die is cast. We have our three experts. We're going to do a little bit of a, a round robin for the first round of questions because we want to talk to you, the three of you, about the challenges of deploying high-density wireless in large venues. Um, Heather, let's go ahead and start with you since since we uh, we started with your introduction. What would you say would be the greatest challenge of deploying in something like a conference center or a stadium where you have a lot of mobile devices all wanting access to the Wi-Fi, all from different manufacturers with slightly different flavors, what's what's the number one thing that a Wi-Fi engineer needs to be aware of? You mean what are the top five things that you need to be aware of? Let's do that. That's <laughs> even you better. That You're too. making more work yeah. for yourself, Heather. <laughs> so um, you, you, uh, you sort of hit the nail on the head about the first thing. So we've got mobile devices, and in, in venues like this, you're seeing uh, at least 80% mobile device, rather, depending on the conference. But really, um, I think the biggest problem is there's no such thing as a cookie cutter. There's no template where you can just sort of like, oh, well, I've been there, I've done that, and I, I know roughly what I'm going to do. Um, let's say, uh, let's take a generic um, uh, venue, uh, like, say, um, a, a stadium of some kind. Um, what's going on there today? What are you designing the network for for today? Because tomorrow it's going to be completely different. And it's not just what the uh, users bring in um, to use, it's who are they? Are they 16-year-olds that are tr looking for Pokemon? Or are they 50-year-olds uh, that are just now sort of figured out how to FaceTime? Um, and so it, the, the, uh, the oversubscription rate that you can assume and the uptake rate for those uh, clients varies greatly. Um, it varies greatly even uh, within a keynote address. I watched uh, traffic just spike. It depends on who's in the audience, but it also depends who's up on stage. If it's a bit of a snorer, then uh, up on stage, then all of a sudden the the data usage um, on the uh, mobile devices goes way up because <laughs> everybody's. I I never even could. That is perfect. Actually, uh, I should have been watching that during the interop keynotes. Yeah, if if you start to see more data being drawn by the APs, it's it means they're bored and they're now looking for something to occupy their time. I, that's a big data correlation. Well, Thank you. And I was sitting in the keynote, and I was grateful for the uh, the the uh, the interesting uh, people who were speaking because it kept my people a little, little quiet and, and uh, placated. <laughs> uh, I, actually, I, I do want to go over to Rick uh, for for something because you, you did mention that you have to be aware of your audience. Uh, are they forty some professionals? Are they sixteen year olds looking for Pokemon? 
Uh, but Rick, there is another aspect aspect to this of uh, this this idea of deploying, especially in a temporary area like a, a convention center or a semi temporary area like like a stadium, and that is security can no longer be an afterthought. I mean, yes, you want to make sure that you can get Wi-Fi access throughout the venue, but at the same time, you also need to make sure that your equipment is secured. You need to make sure that you're locked down for authentication and your portal. What's the work that you've done as far as pen testing, and how does that inform how I might design my convention center wireless network? You bring up a very interesting point. You need to design for security in the first place, and... Um in my experience going to multiple industry conferences and hacker conferences and whatnot, that, that doesn't happen ever. At, at best, security is an afterthought, and it's normally a very poorly thought out one. Uh, so my team got bored the last couple of four years at DEF CON and took over the DEF CON secured wireless <laughs> and grabbed everybody's username and password. And that's it, the biggest hacker conference in the world set up to deflect the biggest hackers in the world and still just security was totally an afterthought and, and a lot of that's just not well thought through. You, you hit the nail on the head when you said we should think about this first. The problem is people absolutely don't. There's a lot of really easy stuff that even mobile devices support these days that is just plain left off. Uh, 802.11w that completely blocks the authenticate attacks. 802.11r that will rapid roam and not try to re-authenticate constantly, which is a big source of slowdown when moving from AP to AP. These are things that all of your basic mobile devices actually support just fine, and we don't ever turn them on. Actually, uh, oh, well, we lost your audio just for, for just a bit there. Uh, which DEF CON was that, by the way? <laughs> uh, mm, let's see. Uh, 17, 18, 19, 20. Wow, okay. Uh, 22, 23. Okay, so, we skipped yeah. skipped one. <laughs> I guess I remember two years ago they moved to uh, you had to get a certificate ahead of time so that you could get into the network. And I was looking at it going, I don't think this is actually going to help. And thank you for confirming that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's pretty much when we thought it was really, really funny and started doing it much bigger, uh, larger antennas and whatnot. <laughs> See, I, I think that's actually the worst of the worst, because when you start doing something like pre-authenticated certificates, you do lull people into a sense of security. They think, oh, now it's okay. I can go ahead and use the wireless. But, of course, we have people like you who just sort of point and laugh. Yeah, we, we had a nice conversation leading up to this. That I'm not going to out anybody, but a lot of people were given really good advice like, oh, I'm going to Black Hat and DEF CON, and I'm leaving all of my gear that I care about at home, or I'm going to bring a brand new netbook and I'm going to blow it up later. But, uh, yeah, the, the false sense of security thing is a really big problem. Especially when you have, you know, a bunch of signs that say WPA passphrase this and people are like, oh, great, it's secure. But if you have the passphrase, you can decrypt every single packet. So realistically, that's exactly equivalent to running an unencrypted network. Well, my favorite was, uh, was it two years ago, they had posters that had little NFC stickers here and it said, you know, tap here to get a freebie. And I'm thinking... Does, would anyone actually do that at DEF CON? And I saw at least three or four people go up there and tap their phones to it. I'm thinking, okay, no, this 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 will not stand. All right, we'll, we'll come back to DEF CON because it is fun and it is coming up, so it's going to be a party. But let's get over to Christopher. Christopher, you work with NetScout. Uh, we've been talking about some of the initial considerations that you must make when you deploy a wireless system. So Heather was talking about making sure that you you can collect metrics, making sure that you look at the audience that will be using the wireless. Uh, we had Rick talk about security and making sure that security is a forethought and not an afterthought in your deployment. From the NetScout point of view and all the tools that you provide, how do you properly collect metrics from a wireless system? Well, you know, I think Heather really hit on it. The key thing that you need to do is have a plan going in. If you have a plan, you can sit down with some form of, plan, some form of planning software and actually lay out the network to achieve what you want to achieve. But you, to do that, as you said, you have to think through what sort of client devices you're going to be servicing, what they're going to need. She made an excellent point about, you know, knowing who your client base is. Are these guys looking for Pokemon? Are they going to be downloading programs? Are they going to be streaming video? That all has a huge impact on the way you plan. And then you go ahead and model that. The thing that a lot of people also miss is they come up with this great plan and they assume it's all going to work out. But let's be honest, the guy who does that plan is not the guy who's going to climb up to the ceiling hanging cables and placing APs. So they just assume that that guy's going to follow whatever they set up. 
And a lot of time that person doesn't because oftentimes the guy on the ladder has no idea what an access point is. Right. And he doesn't really know how to orient an antenna. He doesn't know why it's important. He knows that it's not supposed to be look ugly. So he tucks it behind that nice metal girder. And then, gosh, I don't know why the Wi-Fi is not working. And so we, the thing we see people miss a lot is after they've done all this great planning, get out there and actually validate that it got installed the way you expected it to be. Because if it didn't get installed right, if somebody did something you weren't expecting, put the antenna on wrong, et cetera, you're going to have massive problems and you're not going to be able to figure out why. Another aspect to what I think Rick was talking about that's important for people to think about is that that security has to be thought about up front. But while an event is going on as well, you need some ability to troubleshoot and get out there, get visibility so that you can sense what's going on. And sometimes, yeah, you know, something like DEF CON, you've got a lot going on. But even in just a convention space, like what Heather was talking about earlier, where maybe there's one bad guy or maybe even there's none, there can be well-intentioned people who come in and are causing security holes for you or putting in extra things new, what is, in your opinion, a rogue AP that's going to cause issues long-term. So you also need some kind of troubleshooting or on-the-fly tools that you can walk around with quickly, easily, and get insight into what's going on. And so we really look at it almost like a life cycle. I've got to have pieces and tools throughout all the different steps that I need to take to make sure my event or my stadium or my large venue goes off without a hitch. Actually, Chris, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that point about the people up on the ladders are not the engineers. We, we hit that all the time at Interop, especially when you're deploying in a venue. You don't have the ability to send your engineers up on the ladder. You have to use the union folk, and the union folk are not trained Wi-Fi engineers, so they will do silly things like putting it behind steel girders or, or orienting it the wrong way. Um, open question to the three of you. What has been the worst deployment you've ever seen of an AP in a large venue? I have two oh, worst ones. Uh, yeah, Heather, we'll go with you first. Um, and I got to give a shout out to Twitter's Hey Eddie because he has the uh, BadFi uh, website where he uh, <laughs> people send him pictures of the of the best of the worst yep. uh, deployments. And when if you just want to spew your coffee one morning, you, that's a that's a great place to uh, to just uh, cast your eye on. Um, actually, um, and this is great because both of these were um, uh, ABC competitors of in, in the uh, of uh, other Wi-Fi vendors. Um, one was literally um, company C's access point um, sitting on top of company A's location-based access point and then encased in a steel girder, <laughs> a steel cage. I mean, it was like you, they went out of their way to make sure that this was going to be almost but not quite completely unusable, and it was. Okay, that, that's, that's pretty good. So uh, Wi-Fi sandwich inside of a steel cage that that's that's hard to beat uh rick you you look like you had one uh, do, do you have one that could top that uh more going back to the the statement that was said before of people always install aps very badly uh especially going back to the era of nice big metal access points especially ones with like two antennas on them uh, I saw a convention where they were instructed to install them as close to the ceiling as possible. So they mounted the access point and then they folded the antennas down onto the metal box <laughs> and they put that up against the, the uh, ceiling tiles. So that way it was as, as far out of the way as possible and they literally blocked their own signal with the access point. Which I, I that, that bad, that bad. Okay. <laughs> uh, Christopher, I want to throw it to you in case you've got one. Sure. Do, do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My, my favorite for just making me laugh, and again, credit definitely goes to Bad Fight because this is where this one came from, was, and I don't know what the person was thinking. I don't know why. There, there was a big screen TV that was mounted to the wall. They had decided that the right place to put this AP was to kind of tuck it propped up against the back of the, uh, of the TV, but not mounted in any way, just sort of set in there because why would you put a screw in the wall when you can just kind of shove it on in there and, and assume it'll be fine? But somehow or another... A bird had found this particular location, had to build its nest in the little crook that the AP and the TV made. So you had all these sticks and twigs and a little bird peeking out, the, out of this picture staring at you. 
that one just always made me laugh. Every time I looked at that, and especially because one time when I saw him presenting it, he had a little arrow to it said, it's a freaking bird. Uh, so that one always makes me laugh. That that sounds almost like uh, some sort of art display, Wi-Fi with Nest. <laughs> oh, who knows? Uh, I do want to throw in a, a question from one of our listeners in the chat room right now. We have JJ to the 4884 who has an open question for all three of you, uh, wondering if there's something better than WPA2 for large venue environments uh, something that has high security, but also the convenience of something like NFC. Does that exist? Can you recommend anything? I definitely recommend against NFC. Uh, it's, it's a pretty popular, nearly impossible to secure, especially if you don't even have NFC. I just throw a sticker somewhere that says, scan this for access to the network, and now you have NFC. Uh, in general, it's just kind of really difficult to secure those kinds of things. But WPA is really solid. It's what we use, it's what we want to use. The problem is, is the deployment and how it's configured. So if you do WPA PSK, that means everybody knows the encryption key and they can all decode everything. But if you actually use certificate-based, uh, radius-backed, you, you can give each person their own encryption key and you can keep those packets a lot more secure, a lot safer, makes it a lot harder for people to mess with each other as well. So, I mean, WPA is what you wanna do. It's the, the pre-shared key part that's terrible. Right, right. Yeah. And I'd like to add in, um, and I'd like to draw a distinction between DEF CON and, and Black Hat because uh, I think that uh, maybe you hacked uh, DEF CON, but you weren't at Black Hat hacking last year, um, or at least not my network, you weren't. Um, not that I want to throw the gauntlet down because now I'm sort of terrified of what's going to happen. You shouldn't have said because, that. Oh, um, no. But, and I, I really am terrified about this now. But um, the, the two things, yes, certificate-based and uh, is uh, an excellent way to go. It in And this is where you have to know your audience. You can't do that at Black Hat. There is no way that these crazy little squirrels are going to download a certificate onto their device, um, which is where the previous company a couple of years ago, that Wi-Fi network, was. It was uh, that was one of the problems that they had, aside from the fact that it wasn't really secure. Um, but I got to give a huge shout out to... Uh, a company, RG Nets, who were, they're a riot partner of ours. And they're the guys that secured our uh, our network last year. And they do, uh, amongst other things, and I have to uh, caveat, I am not a security expert. Um, I married up the OSI layer. My, I, my server guy is my husband and he handles all of that for me. Um, but uh, RG Nets, with all due respect to uh, Padre, it, uh, they built a God box. And they, uh, amongst other things, what they do is uh, they do per device VLANing. So it keeps all the crazies. Each de uh, each device is in its own VLAN. I, I, yes, I, and I think the show title now has to be uh, Heather Dares You to Hack Black Hat. Um, oh. that, no, no, we won't do that. We won't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> Could you actually change the banner under her name? That would be perfect. Oh. <laughs> dare her, and you can change mine to Dare Me. That would be great. Oh, oh change, change Heather to You Can't Hack My Wi-Fi because that's, that's, a, just a, that's a red cape to a bull. <laughs> okay, so I do I, I do have a, a tendency to, uh, I have a t uh, quite the t-shirt collection, and the I, I do have one for my new uh, password algorithm that I'll be rolling out at Black Hat in a couple of weeks, so. All right, indeed. Uh, um, okay. I'm sorry, Christopher, did you did you want to add in on that? Uh, I, I think mainly it's the second one, what Rick said. Really, there's nothing wrong with WPA2. I think it gets a bad rap at times. As long as you're using it in an enterprise methodology, particularly trusting in some of the .1x method, uh, methods for authentication, you can have a very secure network. It's more about when you go ahead and enable WPA2 PSK, with the PSK being your company name, that, yeah, you're going to have security problems. Yeah, indeed, indeed. All right, uh, let's let's jump back into uh, the the questions that would, Brian provided you a little bit earlier. I, I want to talk a little bit about deployment cycles because this is one of those things that the more short minded uh, folks in our audience may not consider, and that is that when you're deploying a Wi-Fi system, it's not just putting out gear. You you are deploying a strategy, and that strategy must include. A product cycle. At some point, you're going to have to replace your APs. At some point, you're going to have to up, update your authentication methodology. What advice could the three of you offer for those who are looking for practical experience in, in planning that cycle? Uh, we, we've started with Heather the last few times. I, I want to start with Christopher. Christopher, if someone came up to you, a customer came up to you and said, look, I, I need NetScout's help to plan the next five years of deployment 
at my 10,000 seat enterprise, what would be the practical points you would, you'd want to give him or her? So there's a couple of things that I would point out right off the bat. It's kind of related to something that Heather said, and, and that is that think about not so much what technology you're deploying. Because realistically, it's rarely about the technology that's driving you to replace your gear or replace the gear now or in five years from now. What's driving you is the applications that you want to run. Whatever your business needs from this wireless network, the applications you need to run and the applications you think you might be running two to three years from now and even five years down the line. Because that is what is key to you developing the correct network. If you keep that framework in mind, then using a planning tool will allow you to actually have a network that meets those goals. If you are coming into this whole effort thinking, hey, I'm 11N and I just want to go to 11AC, but you're not actually thinking through usage and what you're trying to achieve, you're really not going to end up with the network you want in a year or two. Right, right. Okay, that's actually pretty good. So consider all the developments in the technology. Make sure that your deployment plan includes those in some way or shape or form and always give yourself an upgrade path. Those, those are always solid pieces of, of advice for anyone who's deploying a, a Wi-Fi network. Uh, Rick, Heather, anything you want to add on top? I would design in as much flexibility as you can um, so that, uh, you, you know, and I, I don't know a single AP that's going to be uh, still in use uh, five years from now. But um, if you make sure that you've got options um, on the the controller side or the, um, the, the uh, within the, the wiring closet so that you, you you can either do a software upgrade and then you've got extra bells and whistles. And the new, um, I, I think uh, uh, Rick was one that was talking about, um, you know, the new amendments that come that uh, it's a constant battle um, in uh, in the world of Wi-Fi to mitigate the damage that's being done by a poor behaving client. As soon as we seem to we, we implement one uh, amendment to fix something, 11R, for example, Apple's going to come out with a way to, to make that not usable, for example. Indeed. Well, that's kind of what they do. We expect that from them. Uh, Rick, I have a, a very particular question for you because both Heather and Christopher have been talking about building flexibility into your deployment plan. But there, there is a thing. Back when I was still actively working, those were the times that you always had to look for, well, things that you were forgetting about security. Because anytime you move from one standard to the next, one piece of gear to the next, one vendor to the next, there's always going to be that whole, well, it works, so I'm going to leave it alone and I don't have to validate it because I validated the last time we installed this wireless network. Do you see that as common? Is that the deadliest time for a Wi-Fi engineer when they're, when they're implementing the plan but not re-verifying? Oh, ab absolutely correct. I mean, I see a lot of things like people that don't know their equipment, people don't know what they're deploying. Uh, we do Wi-Fi fox hunts at DEF CON and people will be tracking around. And you'll see them and you'll you'll just stop them in the hall and be like, no, 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 the antenna goes this way, dude. Like you're pointing it the wrong direction. And and that's a really big problem when you go and you say, okay, I need it. I've got 10,000 tablets. They're 2.4 gigahertz only, but I desperately need this, this new AC access points because they're faster. Then you realize that, you know, none of your stuff actually connects to each other anymore. And all of that just doesn't do you any good. There's a, a very big educational gap, I think. New stuff is great. I'm a huge proponent of new stuff, especially when it comes to security. A lot of those newer amendments that are actually now widely supported that have been around for years, but, but now finally work. It's really important to have those. But if you don't understand what you're deploying, it's never going to work. So knowledge of what you are doing is, is really key. Right, right. Okay, so let's take all of that because we have a practical question from an actual IT folk in the field per, in the field right now. Uh, Emily the Strange wants to know, this is all good. This discussion is great. However, money always has to play a part in the discussion because upgrading this equipment, upgrading your software, verifying the installation is always going to cost you. And they don't have unlimited budgets. So looking at what a typical deployment might look like, what would be your practical advice for an IT manager, for an IT worker who is looking at deploying the fastest, the most secure network that they can, but on a budget? I guess the easier way to ask the question is, where can you skimp and, and not be completely screwed in six months? So if I could actually uh, take this one, it's one of my favorites. I was at a, a convention and... We were all sitting around after all the talks had, had gone and we were discussing we've ever done an initial deployment for Wi-Fi. 
and the whole lot of us, nobody raised their hand and say, okay, so who has actually done a come from behind, fix the mistakes other people made? And the whole group, about 20, 25 of us said, yep, that's, that's pretty much what I do all the time. You put in bids to do this stuff correctly and then somebody will come by and undercut and be like, oh no, you just need an AP every 27 feet. It'll be fine. Just turn all the powers up to max and you'll get great coverage. I would say don't skimp on the plan. More than anything else, look at what are my requirements? You know, is, is the speed the most important thing to me? Is the security the most important thing to me? But actually take that time to plan out what's important, where you're going to put that money and don't go for the cheapest guy who hangs access points. Go for a guy who actually has a plan because that guy could also tell you, you know, I recommend this, but you can get away with this, or I recommend that you can get away with this. And, and there are ways to skimp, but planning is just desperately not the one to skimp on. I, I love that. That is a great approach. Never skimp on the plan so that even if you do have to cut corners for the deployment, you know that you cut corners. So the next person who takes over the project understands this is where it was supposed to be originally until we ran out of cash. Heather, you look like you had a question or a comment you wanted to throw in there. Well, I was going to go uh, uh, what he said, um, but at what he, rather than say where can I skimp, there was the one thing I was going to say where you do not skimp, where you uh, where you absolutely put your money is the guy with the plan who knows what he's talking about. So if, at the bottom of every slide, it should say, and make sure you have a Wi-Fi engineer, an experienced Wi-Fi engineer. Make sure, uh, and 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 he's got good tools. So Christopher can talk about that. But you, you, the Wi-Fi engineer doesn't come with magic glasses. He's got to have the right tools, and he's got to know how to use them. Yeah, uh, Christopher, let's go to you for that because the guy who knows. That's ultimately the person who should be making the, the decision about what goes in the deployment plan. What do we look for? Let, let's say I'm, I'm just the CTO and I, I, I need to hire someone who's going to be able to make my wireless plan. What should I be looking for in a person who says that he or she understands what it takes to deploy a secure wireless network? Well, you know, I think one thing that you should be looking for is what questions they ask. You know, Rick, Rick made some good points. And if you think about what we talked about earlier in terms of what goes into a good plan, these are not questions where you'd come and say, hey, so which model of AP did you pick and what technology is that and how much money do you have? If that's the level of discussion that your Wi-Fi engineer is having with you before, you know, as part of the bid process, that's all they want to know, that's not the right guy because that guy's not going to be able to put together a good plan. You want to find somebody who's actually asking you about your usage so that you feel comfortable that they're going to be putting together a plan that meets what you need to do. And if they're not asking those usage and actual questions about how your network will perform long term for the, your needs, then you have a fundamental problem. The other mm -hmm. thing you do want to find out is what what tool they're using or what are their mechanisms for their plan. You know, there are a lot of options out there and there are still a lot of people who will say, well, you know, my overall goal is a lot of these APs can figure it all out themselves. So I I'm just going to go slap them up on this radius and it'll work out. And if you start to get that feeling, these guys don't have a tool or they're just going to blindly trust that things will work out. That's another big warning sign. All in all, I think coming back to the question about where do I skimp, I think there was a really good implication in what a lot of what Rick said. And that is that if you think about the problems and the things that Rick cautioned about, the reason he cautioned about that is because you are going to spend so much money later on trying to fix this and hiring more people to bring in, plus the lost productivity that costs your company money, that it's worth it to spend a little bit more upfront. It's worth it to make sure that this network is done right, installed right, so that you don't have a problem later on that costing you and bleeding money. And it's so easy to be penny wise and pound foolish in this game because, yeah, nobody has a huge budget. But you, when you're talking to management and when you're thinking about this through, you really need to point out. And a lot of times your company has this data if you ask around. What is the cost if one of these engineers, if one of these salespeople, or if anybody is offline for an hour or even 15 minutes, what is the cost of the company? That data is usually available. And if you can talk about the fact that I can make sure or feel much more secure that that doesn't happen by spending a little bit more now, if you calculate that out nine times out of 10, you're going to find that you actually are saving money by spending more upfront. Right, right. And I think this, this goes back to uh, Rick's whole don't skimp on the planning. Uh, that's, that's the one place where you can't because, and, and, and uh, Christopher, this is to your point, this is really, this is a cover your ass uh, of strategy because when you do eventually break down and when you lose productivity or when you get breached because of whatever system you installed wasn't quite 
up to what you put in the deployment plan, you can show that to the executives and say, this is where you tried to save money and this is how much it cost us. Uh, and that only has to happen once for the people in charge to understand, okay, maybe we should have put more money up front. All right. Uh, I do want to shift gears a little bit because we're running out of time and we've got some great questions from the audience. Uh, both Emily the Strange and JJ to the 4884 want to know, and this is a personal question to the three of you, do you trust any open source software, uh, either deployment software, testing software, or do you only stick with OEM packages? Uh, what's, what's your personal take? Uh, Heather, let's, let's start with you. Well, I like them all, um, and I'm, uh, I, but I've become particularly fond of Wireshark recently. So uh, I have to say, I, I, I play both sides. Good. I, I like that's a great answer. I, I also use I use several tools that were given to me by by vendors who thought that I'd love it, but I tend to stick a bit more to the open source side. I, but I have them all on my on my laptop, so I'm I'm ready to pull them out and use each tool as necessary. Uh, what about you, Rick? As open source as I can possibly be. But that still doesn't mean it's all open source. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there that are great and simply have no open source replacement. A lot of the Wi-Fi planning tools, for instance, there's there's just not a good replacement for those. Those are really good tools. There's a couple of companies that make them. Uh, there's quite a few of them that are very high end and it's great. Then again, there's a lot of products that are very expensive targeting, you know, Windows or Mac. And you could just go to Linux and use it for free. Typically with a live CD, you just download plug a USB stick in for the, the live disc and plug a USB stick in for the Wi-Fi card or whatever, and you're, you're off to the races. So I, I love open source for what it is, especially because you can give it away to people and they can learn and practice. And there's a, a very far, you can get very far with just the open source stuff without, you know, if, even if you're not a professional, I know that this is targeted professionals, but at some point we weren't professionals, right? We were all trying to break into this space and the open source is especially fantastic for that is you can get these tools that the professionals use a lot of times that'll get you a lot of experience, which is awesome. I love that. I love that. And Christopher, I'm going to tweak your question just a little bit because it is still open source versus what's provided by the OEMs. But maybe speak also to firmware because there are plenty of open source <laughs> firmwares out there that can give enterprise functionality to lower cost hardware. Um, what, what has been your stand on that? You know, I don't really have a problem with open source software. I think my big concern is you need to use what works and is actually going to perform the way you need it to. And, you know, obviously we sell some tools. We believe in those tools very heavily. And we do have people come to us, whether it's loading software on a piece of hardware or whether it's a software tool that they have for a particular device. And they say, hey, you know, this particular piece of software does everything I need because I don't need to do all these other things. Well, if you don't need to do all those other things, then that is the right tool for you. In reality, there's another there's another guy just down the block as a network engineer that does have to do these things. And he needs all those tools that, that will enable that. On a piece of hardware loading new software on it, I, I tend to be a stickler. Um, I get really nervous about some of the regulatory implications about loading open source software onto someone else's piece of hardware. Uh, I'm not a regulatory lawyer. I don't play one on TV. But I have had enough exposure in my life to some of the regulatory requirements uh, worldwide to know that there are some implications about loading something other than the original manufacturer's software onto an RF uh, device. I want to go ahead and bring my co-host back into the show. Uh, Curtis Franklin, we have talked a lot about the changing landscape of Wi-Fi, the, the development of different protocols, uh, everything from uh, when we started the show, I think we were still just going through draft end up to 802.11ac and the upcoming Wave 2 devices that are starting to hit the Wi-Fi shores. Uh, it, are, do you have any questions that you'd like to pose to our guest panel here, the, the experts who have been bringing us some, some incredible practical knowledge about that landscape? Well, I think my big question is one that I've asked a, a number of people, but I'd love to get our panelists' take, and that is especially as we look forward to um, 11ac Wave 2, do you think that this is going to be held back somewhat because of the requirement that you basically replace so much of your back-end infrastructure if you want to take full advantage of, of the way to, uh, wave to access points? Um, or 
has everyone already put, you know, 10 gig switches with massive backplane fabrics uh, in their remote wiring closets? So I, um, I, I, sorry, go ahead, Heather. <laughs> that, uh, I was just going to say, well, I think you need to look behind you because wave two washed over you, you know, a while ago. And what I've seen is that uh, as, as, Painfully slow as the adoption process for 11N was, 11AC was like on steroids. And that has been awesome because it's really um, forced us into the dual band. Uh, I see relatively few single band only uh, clients anymore. And, and and so that's all to the to the good. I, uh, I, the, the wired side is, that's painfully expensive to do the upgrades on that. Um, it, I, I haven't seen that, that that there's actually that as as much as wave as 11 AC and wave two is uh, giving us. I haven't seen that it's that that's been slowing down the adoption of uh, 11 AC. Um, I think what you really want to uh, talk about is uh, the axe man cometh, and that's where we're really going to. Um, <laughs> and I and I do think that that uh, 11 AX is going to. As fast as 11AC seems to have rushed towards us, I think 11AX um, uh, may be even more, and that's going to be driving um, the even more. Uh, I, I know we've got the 2.5 gig uh, ports coming online and, and, and all of that, but somewhere in between, I think we just need to keep our, our eyes at, at, at the, what's the next big wave. Okay, hold, hold on. Let's take a step back. If you had not just a customer, but a good friend who was looking at replacing their access points with 802.11 AC Wave 2, would you tell them, hold off a little bit and wait for AX? Or would you say, go ahead and do Wave 2, it's going to be fine? Well, that's not a cookie qu uh, cutter question. Who Who is this friend and where are they and what do they need? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, is 11, is, is multi-user MIMO uh, right. 11 AC, it's, is that really going to benefit them? Um, one of the things that you're going to get with uh, AX is uplink multi-user MIMO. And if it's something like a school, they're, they're, that's going to be a huge benefit. But you can't wait for, you, you know, for the next thing, you know, two or three years before the next thing comes out. Um, so no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't tell any anyone ever to uh, hold off on upgrading their Wi-Fi. Rick, you seem to be laughing a little bit. I was laughing a little bit because I, I liked her her phrasing of that. It, it depends on where they are, right? If they have 811B, then oh yes, definitely buy right. AC yeah. Wave Two. If they have AC, no, no, totally hold off for AX. Um, but to to pull this back to what we were talking about originally, which was using this at, at conventions and large gatherings and whatnot, I think that. To the best of your ability, you should be using very new gear, even if the back end can't handle it at all. And I really mean that even if the back end can basically not handle it at all, there's so many people trying to talk that giving them the ability to speak that much faster means that more of them are going to be able to successfully hold their connections, even if they're basically doing nothing, which is a really big problem at conventions. Uh, we were joking earlier about, you know, when, when the talk's boring, the Wi-Fi usage shoots up. But even when the talk's not boring, there's just thousands of devices connecting to Wi-Fi access points. Just maintaining those connections is a huge load for that airspace. Not for the access points, but there's only so much bandwidth, physical bandwidth in the air. And, and newer technologies take a huge advantage of that. Christopher, you, you get the last word here because unfortunately we, we are over time. Uh, do you want to add your 10 cents in on the, that discussion? Yeah, I'd like to a little bit because when I look at 11AC and I kind of look at Wave 2, what it really enables, particularly for the enterprise space, I think there's a lot of hype. But a lot of people move to, to at least a gig backplane when they, when they put in 11N sometimes. And, and frankly, if you've got a true gig network, that thing is full duplex. So that's really two gigs. Wi-Fi is half duplex. Most of these devices, if you're really going to gain the big fancy numbers that Wi-Fi likes to put against this technology, that's using 160 megahertz channels. That's not terribly common. That's not really going to happen in most enterprise spaces. So I don't really think people should be terribly worried about what their wired backhaul is unless they are very antiquated. If you're on 10100, yeah, be worried. Go update it. But if you're on Gig E, in all likelihood, it's not going to be that big of a bottleneck, even with Wave 2. Wave 2 is more about making more efficient use of your available spectrum with a multi-user MIMO situation. That's just ensuring that I'm not eating up time with a single stream device. But, okay, now I've got three streams devices worth of data, but that's not terribly different than what I have with 11N. 
Now, yeah, 256 Guam, that'll bump me up a bit. But realistically, I don't see this as being that big of a deal to worry about that would stop me from rolling out technology or would halt anything going on. I do agree that, you know, with Heather, that AX is a little bit different and AX is going to be a very interesting animal when it arrives. But the jury's still out on a lot of that. So I, I wouldn't say sky is falling by any stretch of the imagination. And I, I don't buy into anything that says that the wired infrastructure is going to hold back this technology. Well, folks, you've done it again. You've used up another hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 APs on top of APs inside of Steel Girders. I want to thank our panelists for being part of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. This was this was one to remember. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, let's start with Heather Williams of Ruckus. Where should people find you? If, if they want to see your work, if they want to see you at Black Hat, where can they look for the queen of Wi-Fi? Well, at Black Hat, I'll be hiding in the knock. No, I, I, I'll probably be wandering around with a pineapple or something. But um, uh, and then I'm on my uh, Twitter handle is uh, Mo Better Wi-Fi. I, all of those tweets are um, mine, and uh, no, uh, no company should ever take responsibility for anything I say. <laughs> well said, well said. And of course, we are joined by Rick Farina, the R and D director for Pony Express. Uh, Rick, I'm assuming that we can just find you wherever networks are being breached. But if people wanted to see your work, where can they go? Uh, I'm all around. Uh, if you happen to be coming in for Black Hat, please do stop by the Pony booth. But I'm not going to be there. I will be at DEF CON at the Wireless Village teaching people the fun of hacking and how to defend against it by setting up things that they're allowed to break. So feel free to stop in, come say hi, and... If you Google my name, you'll probably find ways to find me on all kinds of places like your IRC channel. I normally uh, camp out at the Hardware Hacking Village, but I think I may have to set up camp at, uh, at Wireless this year, so we'll see. And, of course, Christopher Hins from NetScout. Uh, if, if people wanted to find out more about NetScout, more about the products that you offer, more about the uh, analysis that you can give to people who are planning their wireless deployments, where should they go? Well, if they want to come get a feel for our products, they can come to enterprise.netscout.com, take a look at some of our Wi-Fi as well as some of our wired offerings. If you're looking for me particularly, usually you can find me at some of the WLAN Pros conferences, anything along those lines. I tend to be pretty active in, in wireless as much as I can be. Uh, I do have a Twitter handle, but it's usually not has, doesn't have much to do with Netscout, but uh, that's CSH underscore OTA. So if anybody wants to just randomly tell me uh, tell me what they thought of this particular episode, you're more than welcome to. I'll probably ignore it. Heather, Rick, and Christopher, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, you know what? This was so much fun. I, I, can I invite you individually to come on future episodes of Twilight? Because this, this was sort of you know a fun panel discussion, but I'd love to pick your brain when we've got a solid 30 minutes just to, just to talk it out. Anytime. Fantastic. Absolutely. All right. I'm bribable. And, and actually, I'll be at a Black Hat hammering on your network. So there, there we go. <laughs> thank you again. And, of course, we need to thank my co-host, Curtis Franklin. He, uh, he kind of pulled big duty today because we normally have at least two co-hosts. Thank you for being part of this episode. Curtis, if they want to find you, your radio show, where can they go? Well, the big place to find me uh, on a daily basis is on Twitter at KG4GWA. But uh, my... Typed words, my audio, my video all lives ultimately at informationweek.com. And uh, for those who do follow Information Week Radio, we've got a lot of changes coming up in the month of August. Uh, big changes in Information Week, uh, big changes for Information Week Radio. So stay tuned. It's not being a sleepy summer even one little bit. Thank you again, Curtis. You are my sunshine in the dark of the network closet. That did not sound right. We'll do another one next time. Uh, of course, we want to thank you, the loyal listener or viewer who comes back week after week for his or her fix of enterprise goodness. Now, we want to make it easy for you to get this week in enterprise tech on your device of choice. So please, please, please go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. That's T-W-I-E-T, -E this week in enterprise tech. There you'll find not just all of our back episodes, but also links for subscribing. Do you want an audio version on your phone so you can listen on your way to work? You can do that. Do you want a, a video version on your tablet so you can watch us at break? You can do that. Do you want the high-definition video version on your Mac, your PC, your laptop, or your desktop so that you can watch us on your big screen when you get home? You can do that. It's all at twit.tv 
slash twyatt. Also, don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash PadreSJ. If you follow me there, not only will you find out what I'm doing when I'm not hosting shows on the Twit TV network, but you can also suggest guests for future episodes of This Week in Enterprise Tech and topics. In fact, Brian Chi, who is now our producer, he has pulled directly from Twitter many of your great, great ideas. Please keep them coming because we want to give you what you need here on Twiet. Also, don't forget that we do this show every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. Live.twit.tv is the link to go to if you want to see the pre-show, the post-show, and everything that gets cut out of the final mix. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv? It's filled with some of the most brilliant engineers, some of the funniest trolls, and yes, some good old-fashioned Twit army folk who will keep you company as we go through this experiment that we call Twit TV. Next week, I am out and taking over hosting duties will be Curtis Franklin. He'll be back here with Lou and Chevert. They'll be taking th through all of the goodness that is uh, is Twyatt. And until then, thanks to everyone here in the studio who makes this show possible, to Lisa and Leo for letting us do Twyatt, to my TD who this week is is Anthony. Anthony, I'm not sure if you have a camera on yourself. Hey. Uh, could you tell people what it is that you do here except play Pokemon? <laughs> do a lot of Pokemon, but I'm also a producer for um, the new screensaver, so check it out this Saturday. Actually, Padre, you are our co-host. Oh, wait, 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 I am? Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, good. Did you get the memo? That's good to know. Oh, Thank yeah. You. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, check it out. We have um, the CEO of Chip to show off the the new pocket chip. Ah, yeah. okay. So, yeah. yeah, check it out. Yeah, the, he's, he's got a few things going on. Until next time, I am Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, just reminding you, but if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.